worldview. Many thanks for staying with us. Of course, uh, one of the biggest stories we have today is that a visit to China by President Uhuru Kenyatta, a number of the trade deals that have been signed there. We will be speaking to our reporter, Rosalino Bala, who is in China, just taking a look at some of the developments and some of the uh, deals that are being signed uh, there by the Kenyan government and their counterparts in China. And also joining me in studio now is Abel Oyeyo from the Center for African Pro Progress. Thank you very much for coming in. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning to you. Well, China is still big news. Uh, we understand a number of deals are being signed. Rosalina Bala will be giving us more on that. Yeah. But is this good news for Kenyans? Uh, yeah, it's good news. Mm -hmm. It's good news. I think... Uh, uh, the kind of development Kenya has been able to realize over a short duration that, you know, it's built very close ties to China is remarkable. You can see the superhighway and so many other projects, including the SGR. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the goodies uh, the Chinese have been giving the president, that is President Kenyatta, yeah. uh, uncountable. So I think it's good news for Kenyans. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think for China, because China, the Chinese don't just give stuff. They also get something back in return. And on that note, so on what you say, it's not really, it's, it's a give and take. That is it. So what are we giving back? Um, well, they find a market. Kenya has always been a very, very uh, solid market for, the, for Chinese products. And, uh, of course, uh, the Chinese, just like the Americans and the British, always have interest, not just in Kenya, but in uh, East Africa, Central Africa and all that. And Kenya is like a launching pad for the interests in the wider uh, African region. So they get that kind of conducive climate mm -hmm. to conduct their businesses. Are we still sending a message that we are more leaning towards the east, east. I think that is what has been happening during the Uhuru presidency the and actually. yes and I think it's for a good reason because over the last like let's say five decades since independence we've been very close to the Americans and the British we've not been able to realize so much in terms of development so a short duration of moving east, east. we see so much so it is a good thing yes I think it's a good thing yes if re-elected in the next five years and possibly would be still leaning east from the kind of policies that have been put in place. Where are you seeing Kenya? Because you say that we have been more developed in the five years than we have in the past decades with us leaning more towards the west. Yes, I think if uh, the president gets re-elected, uh, most, <coughs> most likely he's going to pursue the same, same east-looking policies. And uh, I expect, of course, uh, even more development in terms of infrastructure and all that. And... Um, Obviously, that's a good thing for, for, for Kenya. Now, the problem is the Chinese do not care so much about the internal conditions of the country they're doing business with. If maybe, let's say, there is a problem with human rights, they don't care so much. We saw it in southern Sudan. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the Kenyans making sure that what we do with the Chinese is just business. They come and build our roads, and that is it. Yeah. They do not make us forget that we need to take, to take care of our politics, our domestic issues, the way they should be taken care is, of. Is, is it how the world should be moving? Like, every country should just mind its own business? That is what it means. And, and, and let's work when it's beneficial for both of us? I think that is how it's supposed to be. That is how it was meant to be after independence. We should have focused on developing our infrastructure, our, you know, social issues and education and all that. But I think we forgot. We expected our colonial masters to keep on doing things for us. And that is why there are so many problems in so many African countries, because we still expect the West to come and solve them for us. So I think we need to show that we can also do our things on our own. And let's get into business as well. We don't just expect to be given stuff. We also give back. Yeah. So that is why I think looking east is good. We learn to be responsible as, as African nations and Kenya is, I think, leading the way. Yeah. As, we, as we look east, our debt has also been... Uh, ballooning. Ballooning. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for us? Because we continue to look east and definitely the debt will continue to balloon. I think uh, taking care of the national debt is an economic issue and it can be taken care of internally. It doesn't have to, you know, it should not interfere with the uh, external businesses. Uh, fiscal responsibility is a function of government operatives. They have to make sure that the kind of policies they enact do not add to the debt. And I think uh, the kind of borrowing you've been witnessing is irresponsible because the money does not go to projects we can see. For example, the Thika Superhighway was funded by the Africa Development Bank. And, and we can uh, see it. Yes. Yeah, so much of the money that has been bo borrowed and led, to, of course, to the ballooning of the debt, I don't think it can be accounted for in a reasonable way. 
So doing business with this does not necessarily mean our debt goes up. Mm -hmm. No. There's a way in which we can do productive business with the Chinese and other countries without yeah. necessarily adding to the debt. Which Chi is China, mm. um, sorry to cut you short, okay. China is, is, is big on infrastructure. And if there's one thing that the Jubilee government has invested heavily in is infrastructure. But have we focused so much on infrastructure and ignored all the other sectors? No, um, I don't think so because after independence we didn't focus so much on infrastructure and uh, I'm an old school economist, <laughs> <laughs> so I believe that you cannot make any pr reasonable prog uh, or development or progress mm -hmm. if you don't have infrastructure. Talk about roads, talk about railways and all that, and, you know, air strips and airports. Once you have that, you open the country for development. That is why I think after the Stika Superhighway, you know, Kiba came in as an old school economist yeah. and focused so much on infrastructure. So that is why we were able to see remarkable economic development over a very short, you know, period of time. So I don't think focusing so much on infra infrastructure is a problem. It is, it is actually a good thing. Does it pay back? Because uh, from the conversations you get um, down on the grassroots levels is, yes, we are concentrating on infrastructure, we are building roads, we are building the rail system, mm -hmm. but are we seeing the returns on first-time value? Yeah, okay. Uh, it takes time, of course, and there's what we call... Uh, empowerment of citizens to take advantage of the kind of roads and uh, railways we construct. Um, I mean, if the government is able to empower the citizens, then they can take advantage of all those, you know, um, uh, projects. Talk about maybe the SGR and all that. Now, if you invest so much in uh, infrastructure and you don't empower the citizens, they cannot see the benefit. For example, guys will be focusing on you know, a meal, like now we're talking about the price of hunger and all mm -hmm. that, which is a bit of a shame. Now, that is because the government does not support the small projects which are meant to empower people. So and and that's why I asked, are, are we concentrating too much on infrastructure at the expense of these other sectors that are equally important to Kenyans? I, I think, no, I don't think so. What we're doing is just making a mistake by engaging in so much corruption, mm. which of course <laughs> cuts funds from going to the grassroots. Yeah, so the kind of attention given to infrastructure is not so much. The problem is we, we you know, perpetuating the crime of corruption and that is why now the people cannot feel the impact of the projects we're working on. So we just need to make sure we diversify the investments we, we, we're engaging in and then, of course, we deal with corruption, which is a big, big mm -hmm. problem. Not mm -hmm. just, of course, in Kenya, but yeah. so many African countries. Well, apart from infrastructure, the president and uh, his counterparts uh, held bilateral talks and a deal on security. The president has been lobby lobbying for Ami Som and more funds to go into these troops to just ensure that they stabilize uh, Somalia. Remember, we had the conference the other day in yes. London yeah. for Somalia. Do you think this particular deal would go a long way not only in stabilizing Kenya as far as security is concerned, but the Horn of Africa country as well. I think so. The deal that was signed, I think, of course, it's meant to make sure that Somalia is on standing army mm -hmm. so as to be able to deal with the militias like Al-Shabaab and all that. And obviously, you understand there's what we call a spillover of conflict from uh, Somalia, not just to Kenya, but to other, to other neighboring countries, countries as well. Yes. So once Somalia becomes stable and it's got its own army and, you know, the militias can be taken, uh, taken care of from within, then you cannot be able to see the kind of attacks you've seen uh, time and again mm -hmm. on Kenyan soil. And that means it's going to be peaceful. Businesses can be able to, you know, be conducted without any problem. And the refugee crisis that has been, you know, facing so many African countries because of the instability in Somalia will be taken care of. So the deal is good. And I'm looking forward to implementation because, you know, so much talk and uh, so little action means nothing. But I'm hope hopeful that... Uh, this particular deal will be implemented because the president has a lot of goodwill. The guy, the guy was, uh, you know, given the leadership in Somalia, and it's likely to be good. And um, leading the world out completely, but it can be reduced to levels that, of course, cannot cause uh, alarm or something or even f or fear. So if um, uh, Somalia has an army that can take care of the militia very well, it means they won't be able to launch attacks, maybe on, on Kenyan soil or maybe other neighboring countries, which means we will have stability here and the kind of problems we're seeing in Somalia will also go down, which is good. And the refugee factor? Uh, now, if the militias won't be able to launch attacks mm -hmm. inside Somalia, the Somalis won't have a reason to run away. 
which means the number of Somalis running away will go down. So the refugee problem will be also, you know, dealt with in, a, mm -hmm. I think, a decisive manner. Mm -hmm. So Somalia needs an army, and that was a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Let's just uh, talk about uh, the security situation in uh, South Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of refugees again ballooning into Uganda, yeah. about 800,000 of them. Quite unfortunate. What, what, what do you think about the situation there right now? I think uh, Southern Sudan has been a, a problem, and it's likely to be a problem for a while because of, I think, uh, it's a young nation. We joined the community of nations in uh, 2011. And uh, just like Kenya, they have the problem of uh, tribe, mm -hmm. ethnicity and all that. Um, I expect African leaders, again, to come together and support Southern Sudan. The president has been taking some final actions. Re recently, I think he fired his uh, chief of staff. Chief of staff, yes. Which I think to me was a much needed step. Because you remember Malong was accused of being responsible for mm -hmm. very, very... Uh, atrocious acts, I think, way back in July mm -hmm. last year, where so many guys were killed. And he comes from the president's uh, Dinka tribe. Mm -hmm. So sending him home was a message that you cannot come here, cause a lot of problems and expect to be around. I think it has a lot of support. As much as some people might view it as a bad, as a bad step, I think it was okay. But for people who support him, would it not trigger more some unrest rebel. in South Sudan? I don't think so. Even the replacement was from the president tribe, which mm -hmm. means there will be no rebellion. It's a win-win situation. I think so. And I think uh, countries that have a lot of interest in Somalia, Sudan, Southern Sudan st stability, like the U.S., even the U.N. itself, have always wanted uh, Malong to be fired. So I think it's, it's, it's overdue. It's long overdue. It was uh, much needed action. Yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. I think we like, we, most likely, with the firing of the guy, there'll be some kind of satisfaction and uh, the fighting will go down. Even the elements from the Mashar, uh, you know, faction of the unrest and all that can calm down and, you know, we can see maybe a reduction in the movement of guys from southern Sudan to the neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest problem they have, of course, is famine. Guys cannot access food. Okay. Yeah, so, all right. yeah. All right, Abel. Thank you so much for coming in. Let's just speak to our reporter um, from the Standard uh, newspaper, Rosalino Bala, who's uh, joining us live from Beijing in China by way of phone with an update on just what exactly is going on. Roslyn, um, how are you? I hope you are well from Beijing in China. A number of talks have been ongoing since the president landed, some deals signed. What do we expect today? Yes, Akita, you're very fine here. There have been a number of activities, back-to-back -back meetings. Uh, the uh, Belt and Road Forum began yesterday uh, with keynote address from various uh, global leaders, uh, including the host himself, President Xi, and other global leaders like the Russian President, uh, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antony Guterres, and other leaders. Uh, but before that, the president was able to meet some of the companies here on his arrival uh, to this place on Saturday. Some of the bilaterals that have been signed include the Huawei uh, uh, deal where they're supposed to give our security officers some communication gadgets. Uh, today, this afternoon, the president is expected to make a roundtable contribution on people-to-people -people integration on the infrastructural development in Kenya, among other integrated uh, activities that Kenya has done, not just with the region, but also China. The president is also expected to meet uh, his host uh, president today, this evening, uh, which Kenyan time might be almost uh, midnight today, uh, before he departs back home. But this morning, that was around 5 a.m. Uh, Kenyan time, they were able to retreat uh, to a place called Tangi Lake uh, International Convention Center. Uh, the 28 heads of state retreated there. They were able to have a roundtable discussion. And we are yet to get uh, some of the far-reaching agreements that they were able to sign. They just uh, uh, took a short break to take a photo session, and they're back again. For that deliberation. 
All right, Rosalind, let's just take a look at some of the deals that have been signed so far by the president or the Kenyan government and their counterparts there in China. Uh, so, uh, by yesterday, there were only two uh, deals that were signed. Uh, one was the 200 billion investment that will be done in Wasindishu, Eldoret County, and that involved some of the Kenyan investors and Chinese investors here. Then there was the Huawei uh, deal where the president himself visited the plant to just uh, agree on some of the investments they will do. Uh, we are also told that uh, Huawei is planning to invest on a massive iron and steel uh, deal in Kenya, which we are yet to know how much the deal will cost. Uh, but today, because the president and the other heads of state retreated for this private meeting, uh, his, most of his bilaterals are expected to start late this evening uh, before he departs. All right, Rosalind, thank you very much for that update. Our reporter, Rosalind Obala, joining us there from um, Beijing in China, where they're covering President Uru Kenyatta in his tour in China, signing a number of the deals there that Rosalind has told us about, holding bilateral talks, and uh, we're going to see uh, the kind of goodies that the president will be bringing back home. So. Roslyn has given us an update there. What do you make out of all these activities that we have in China as the government? I, I think now, I, I, like we said earlier, it's good news for Kenya. The president, I think, uh, has gone out to uh, bargain mm -hmm. for Kenyans and make sure the tempo of development continues. Like they deal with Huawei, if it, you know, it comes to pass, it's likely to create jobs and uh, you understand the, one of the bigger, biggest problems young men have not yet, not just young men, mm. let's say youth, it's lack of employment. So if such a company comes here and pumps a lot of money into the economy, you know, jobs will be created and it's a good thing for the country. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. We'll see how that goes. Abel, thank you very much. Always a pleasure having you here on Worldview. Thank you. Abel, oh yeah, you're there joining us on uh, Worldview. And of course, he's always here on Worldview.